Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Romanticy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Excellent. I still stumble over that a bit, don't I? I still want to say epic fantasy romance. I don't know. Maybe I can say both. I've got to figure it out. So not a polished production around here. Uh, today is Monday, April 1st. April Fool's Day here in the U.S. I don't know if that's like a thing elsewhere in the world. Um, interestingly to me, over the last umpty years, whatever, I've been seeing more and more pushback against uh, April Fool's Day and pranks. Uh, people saying that pranking is cruel and not to try to fool people. I've never been a fan of of practical jokes or pranks. Um, I tend to agree that there is a, a cruelty to it, a bullying aspect. Uh, there are times when it is super witty and that's always enjoyable, but for the most part, it's, yeah, there is a kind of, um, unkindness to it. I remember my mom, dated someone for a little while who uh, was very fond of jokes and pranks. And yeah, he did have a, a mean side to him. But we were up at a, a cabin for Christmas. The family had gotten together and he came. I think it's the only Christmas he spent with us. And my mom's sister, my aunt Karen and her husband came along and my husband David. So there were six of us and it was a nice Christmas. Um, <laughs> and this guy who shall remain unnamed, uh, convinced my mom to go along with this great prank that he had. I don't know if he'd played it before, but he'd kind of figured it out. Um, but he said, what you do is you look in the newspaper and you see what the winning lottery ticket number was for the day before. And then you go and you buy a lottery ticket with those exact same numbers and show it to somebody. And let's see, am I getting it right? Yeah. And then you show them the paper and, sh and so that they'll think that you won. Right. Uh, so he kind of bamboozled my mom into going along with this. She didn't really want to, but so she did this. So she showed um, Karen, the lottery ticket and the, you know, just that page on the paper showing where the, the numbers were. And she's like, Karen, I, I think maybe I won. And Karen's like, Oh, well, you know, I don't know. And so she looks at it and she's going, wait, wait, they all match. They all match. She, and she got really excited. And David and I were in on it. We knew what was going on. I think, cause my mom had told me and but my aunt Karen like actually started to jump up and down and she's like, Kathy, you won. And it was, um, oh, I don't know how to describe it. It was, it was heartbreaking. Um, the reveal, uh, it was not funny. It was, she had been so tremendously happy for my mom in those few minutes. Uh, and then to have it just be crushed and not only have that joy taken away, but to know that it was done at her expense. Uh, and my mom hated herself for going along with it. And it was, yeah, it was really just kind of awful. Uh, one of the more deliberately cruel things I've, ever seen somebody do, which I suppose means that I've lived a pretty good life, but still. Anyway, there will be no April Fool's jokes on uh, the podcast today. Uh, not into it. Not into it. The one that I do know about that turned out really well was uh, quite a few years back. Um, Ilona Andrews, uh, the couple that writes, uh, 
Urban Fantasy, Kate Daniels books, they did an April Fool's joke where they announced that they were going to write a book with um, Q as the hero being the, you know, the who had been the villain. Sorry, I'm not explaining this well. He had been the villain through all of the Kate Daniels books and a really reprehensible guy. And so they did this book announcement with like the full book blurb saying that, you know, like Hugh was going to be the reformed villain and become the hero. And they had, um, you know, like teamed him up to fall in love with this witch and all of this kind of thing. And everybody glommed onto the idea. They were so shocked. Everybody's like, yes, give us this book, give us this book. And they ended up writing it. But it was really kind of funny because they had originally intended it as, you know, like nobody wants you as a romantic hero. And they misjudged <laughs> their audience. They misjudged our loves of a, uh, a reformed villain. So, um, yeah, there we are. April Fool's jokes. I'm kind of amused. If you're on video, you can see. But if not, I'll describe. I'm wearing a T-shirt that I bought in Ireland. And so it's got a a Celtic cross on it on the sort of the left side here, the left breast. And it's um, a surfing t-shirt from Ireland. And then I'm also have on this jacket that I bought in Tucson, which has a glittery saguaro cactus on the left breast. And so they're kind of overlapping and it's a funny juxtaposition. It's like Irish surfing and desert saguaro. <laughs> but I feel like that actually covers the spectrum of me and who I am rather, rather well. So let's see. Um, I didn't get a ton written on Saturday or not at all on Saturday. On Friday, um, I had a decent-ish first hour and then I hit tired. But it was a it was an okay week for my first week of ramping up again. Um, I got 4,600 words, a little over 4,600 words. So now I am diving completely in. I finished listening to the audiobook for Reluctant Wizard. I really like that. I, it's much easier for me to get my head back into the story space by listening to the audiobook than um, reading or looking at notes or anything else. I'm not sure why that is, but I think it has to do with the fact that I'm an auditory learner. And so listening to audiobooks for me is problematic because I forget to pay attention to the audiobook. It start, I start spinning other stories in my head, other people's audiobooks. But listening to audio formats of my own books, I start spinning the story and it's on the correct topic. So it's, it's really a um, very useful way to go about it. So I'm very happy because now I have finished listening to the audiobook. I think I know I'm, where I'm going with this new book. Um, I've had uh, some, some nice feedback over the last couple of days. Uh, a friend of assistant, Corrine, started reading Dark Wizard. Corrine messaged me about it. Let's see when. So Corrine messaged me on Friday saying that her friend had uh, finished Dark Wizard at 11 p.m. the evening before and decided to make a start on Bright Familiar. And uh, it was a short night. <laughs> I tell you what, that's like one of my favorite things, although I feel bad for people missing out on sleep. But I love it when readers tell me that they like stayed up all night reading the book and couldn't stop. I, I always want to have a pass to give to people's bosses the next day. Um, you know, like a, a sick pass, um, a nap pass, uh, because I do feel responsible. Uh, but it's a glorious, glorious responsibility. It's the best compliment there is. So yeah, then she apparently went ahead and bought um, all of the books and she's she read all six. Um, starting on Thursday, now she's read all six, and she messaged me and asked me um, how long she was going to have to wait for Elisa's book. So it's like, well, I'm writing it now, but 
you know, hope to have it out in by the end of May. That I don't know if I've mentioned that here, but that is my goal. It kind of depends on if um, editor Allie comes back with any substantive edits on Never the Roses. I haven't heard from her on that. Uh, I kind of wish she would because I would like to get my next installment of money. <laughs> uh, but also, like, put this off. Um, did I tell you all? I think I did. I'll tell you again because it's such great news. Oh, I told you on Friday just that uh, I found out that they're planning to do book two in hardback also. And so isn't that exciting? They said that um, so hardback of Never the Roses is going to come out on August 5th, 2025. And then they said the paperback version of it will come out on like July 6th. 2026. So it's just going to be in hardback for a long time. I assume also ebook. It's got to be an ebook too. Um, but as far as paper versions, it's going to be in hardback for nearly a year before they do paperback. Um, and then they said that that would be a month before the release of book two in hardback, which is exciting. I'm um, yeah, so I did say that it would be nice to know what um, my deadline was for writing book two. <laughs> it's funny because I was talking with, actually, I think it was um, the delightful Grace Draven. Um, ju we, we just catch up periodically on texting and um, mostly Discord DM these days. So many communication modalities, right? And so I was telling her about all of that. And she listens to the podcast too. So hi, Grace, darling. Uh, but she said um, that if, I, I said, well, I think that probably they will want the book in September-ish. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit later, but that was when we sold the first book and they want this on the same schedule. So I'm guessing it's going to be something like that. And she was like, if somebody told me that I had to deliver a book Somebody told me now on the 1st of April that I had to deliver a book by September. Uh, what did she say exactly? She's so colorful. Well, all she said was that she'd flip out. So, Grace, you have let us all down on the colorful category. But, hey, it was me who said, built up expectations there. But uh, she, she is darling. Um, there's a reason why I love her. But, um, yeah, that's... I'll have to, uh, yeah, I can write it in like three months, four at most, if it's really difficult, right? So that's not terrible. So, but I would like to know. I, and I did ask, and I don't know yet. There we go. Uh, let's see. So um, do I have anything to talk about otherwise? It's had a really nice weekend, a really quiet weekend. I, I did a lot of downtime and that helped. I'm feeling perkier and yeah, spent some good social time with people. Uh, you know, like, I don't know if we've talked about, oops, on here, the, uh, the Clifton strengths thing. Um, Becca Syme does a lot of author coaching and she's like in her corporate life, uh, learned how to teach people how to use their Clifton strengths. And I did my Clifton Strengths and got the top five and just did like the free online. I had to pay like 20 bucks for that. But then I did like the free online analysis. But I'm sorry, Becca, I did not do your coaching or anything like that. I just, uh, what can I say? I'm cheap. And so I found out my Clifton Strengths, which I can share here. So my strengths are the my top five. Number one is connectedness. And I think I've ranted about that on here before because it's like, what am I supposed to do with connectedness? Um, then number two is learner. Three is achiever. Four is intellection. Five is input. So, you know, like my other four strengths are pretty much what you'd expect. Um and, and, and what I regard as useful. But connectedness, I hadn't really, you know, you know, people have explained it to me, you know, like, oh, well, 
you know, like the, the fact I'm a Taoist that I believe in the connectedness of the universe probably comes out there. Uh, and my, you know, like volunteering and working with people and even this, this is a connectedness thing for me, but I've never been really sure how to use it as a strength. And I was going back and forth a little bit with Becca on threads and she's so generous um, and gives great advice. So I, I really do recommend her. But she said uh, that she was having to remember about her own connectedness strength. And I was like, oh, wait, I haven't met anybody else that's like also into connectedness. I suppose there's probably a parallel that we both do things like mentoring and coaching. But she said that um, to, to ping her connectedness strength, she has to remember to connect with people, that spending time with people on shared interests on things that you both enjoy is is how she feeds that part of herself and I found that really useful um, so I have been trying to do that more trying to deliberately reach out and connect with people so I got to do several fun social things this weekend and son of a gun it works it, it did help refill the well so that was great um, I did a blog post yesterday on ROI and uh, return on investment. And so that might be interesting to look at. I've gotten some nice comments on it. Uh, I know I talk about threads a lot, but I'm, I actually get engagement on threads. I actually have conversations with people. And like if I post my link to the blog post, like I did yesterday, a couple of people picked up that a blog post and commented on it. And I'm not getting that on any other social media, really. Uh, I know that seems funny to say, you know, like getting actual engagement, having conversations with people. Um, I'm on Blue Sky and like nobody ever says anything to me on there. I don't know if the algorithm or what, but it's like I almost never get any kind of interaction. Whereas threads, there's a lot of good interaction. So and Facebook, I still get interaction. And Twitter, X, whatever, um, a little bit. But anyway, I'm, I'm actually kind of liking threads. Instagram, I still like too. Anyway, um, I had a point. Oh, yeah, ROI, return on investment. I was very interested. I did a little bit of research as I was writing the blog post to find out that this is the return on investment is also known as the DuPont model or method. And it was developed in 1914 as a way to uh, analyze whether or not a business was viable. And one of my things, and I talk about this in the blog post, so I won't go on a whole lot here, is I hear authors talk about ROI a lot, um, mostly like citing things like female romance authors citing things that their husbands have said about them going to conferences like well what kind of roi do you get from a conference um are you going to sell enough books to justify the cost which has always struck me as the husbands not wanting their wives to go to the conference uh, like I know one gal who told me that she wasn't going to be able to come back to our WA conference the next year because her husband felt like they should spend that money on a family vacation that they could all do together. And it's like, oh, the thing that's why, you know, I, I know that there's a number of you guys out there who listen and love you all, but that's why I tend to focus on the challenges facing female creatives, because this is a huge one. It's like, well, how dare you spend money and going to something that's only for you? Uh, we should spend this money on a vacation with me and the kids. What's the ROI? So anyway, uh, one of my points, and it always has been, is that a whole lot of being a career author is the long game. And I feel like I can say this with some authority now because I have been doing this since, well, it's really 30 years. Cannot believe it. Um, my first published work was in 1994. Um, and I have always thought of this as the long game, that it is a gradual uh, accumulation and 
reputation and I knew it was going to be up and down. And, you know, that was the, the wave I was willing to commit to. Uh, and ROI is, is a lot of your investment is intangible, right? Going to a conference, you never know when some reader, you know, like this friend of assistant Kareen's, you know, like that she bought all six books this weekend. Those books have been out for a long time, right? You just don't know when people are going to pick things up. Uh, it's like I've been talking about with this whole rise of romanticy. Uh, you know, it's like, well, who knew? Who knew what the, it was going to like all of a sudden be the hot genre, right? I always thought it would be because it's sort of my my blessing and my curse. Like the fairy godmother who kissed my brow <laughs> in the cradle uh, said that I would always be ahead of my time. And I am. I am like 10 years ahead of, of everybody else. Um, and it is people respond to that and say, oh, you know, that's really great. You know, at least I'm not chasing trends, but um, being 10 years ahead of, of everybody else uh, has, it sucks in certain ways, <laughs> but that's not the point. Uh, I think ROI is a useful analysis if you're looking at a very, very specific situation. And uh, one person who commented was Charlie's Book Rex, uh, who is starting a business on giving more advice to authors on marketing. She wants to give solid advice. And she said authors ask her about ROI a lot. She liked my post. So, I mean, we should say that. And she said that she always says you can only expect a measurable, quantifiable ROI if there is something explicit to track. And she said that she thinks in authorship, as I said, there's a lot of intangible investment in return. And she said, but if you are looking for an equal X sales, then you need to do trackable links. And I think that's really, it, it's good advice because it's also a reminder that looking at something like ROI has to be very small and specific. Go read the blog post. Anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful Monday. I hope you have a great week ahead. And I will talk to you all on Friday. You all take care. Okay. Bye-bye.